Drew. Woo! Am I? Yes, cool. So, there we go. Um, so, hi, I'm Drew. I work in, uh, well, web platform now on GraphQL stuff, but this isn't about that necessarily. So, what I'm going to talk about is kind of a little bit of a story about um, a project I've been working on kind of on the side and a nice kind of tool that I've been using to go along with it. So, there we go. So I've been working on a project called Parallel. So it kind of existed for a while, um, a bit before me. It's been around for, I think, seven or eight years now. Um, but what it is, is it aims to be kind of, it helps students in kind of high school um, who are really interested in mathematics, but they maybe don't have the support from their school to um, maybe like go the extra step. If you're really into maths and you really love it, but your school is maybe underfunded and all that jazz. Um, this is a way that stu students can engage in maths outside of their regular lessons without, um, if they don't have that support. So what it kind of looked like before was a bit like this. So this has been around for a while. It's kind of all built in view um, and it allows students to sign up and do weekly um, kind of maths worksheets. So here's an example of what one looks like, but the gist of it is every week, a student can come to the site and there'll be a kind of themed maths worksheet. So um, they've all got kind of generic topics and stuff and they've got like YouTube videos in there and funny images and GIFs and all that jazz. Um, but the gist of it is, is that you sign up for an account and then you can kind of fill out these and answer the, um, answer the questions. And I can get about some of them right, but my maths isn't as good as year seven, surprisingly. So um, yeah, it's not great. It's a bit embarrassing. You have to look up the answers to get the successful um, passes to test stuff. Um, cool. So now they want live events. So we've got all these worksheets and those are done every week and students can kind of be prompted via email and their teachers to um, do all these worksheets, but they want to kind of go the extra steps. So they have our, what are live events. So it started off as um, kind of once a month or twice a month there'd be a kind of YouTube event. So students would get emailed via the email that's in their parallel account, and then they'd be kind of encouraged to join a YouTube link and they'll follow along and they'll be kind of fun and engaging and they can um, then engage via things like a Slido. So they give them a Slido link and you go and answer mass questions and follow along and all that stuff. But obviously that's not perfect. You've got this kind of ex existing ecosystem with login and user data and all that kind of information you want to kind of link those together because when you've got the data there you can better engage and you can work out where students are maybe dropping off or is it the same students coming every week or are we just burning through all the students in the country and um slowly working our way through so kind of the aim was where i came in is to work on version two so there's a bunch of features that they kind of want to do a lot of it runs around data and engagement so there's kind of a few things here so things like one-way chat. So at the moment with YouTube, it's very much you can have chat on, you can have chat off. And with students, um, as young as now, it's going to as young as nine. You don't want to really have that because it's open to abuse and people can kind of, um, you want it to be a more, bit more safe. So having a one-way chat where students can engage with the hosts um, through messaging, as, long as, as well as all the questions and things. Um, but having that available so they can kind of engage and you can see what's going wrong and if there's any issues and um, ask kind of open-ended questions, things like that. So then moving that YouTube link, if you move that into the parallel page, not only can you track the attendance of exactly who is watching, you can encourage them to sign in and we'll know who they are, but you can also get a live attendance data. So you can see, oh, this student was engaged for half an hour, then dipped off for five minutes, came back, or this student kind of came in late, maybe we need to adjust the timing, that kind of thing. So it gives you a lot more information that you can use to target the maths for the students. And then things like the Slido. So before there was a Slido, you've got to encourage them to open it in a separate tab and then um, kind of follow it on that way, where we can bring that into the page and link it all together so you know which students submitted what answer. Maybe the questions are, um, if people are regularly falling down, you can see, oh, was it this age group was um, kind of getting this wrong? Maybe we should target it or maybe we should focus that next week on things like that. So most of it revolves about data and linking all the ecosystem together. So how are we going to do this? So if you're obviously things like Slido, but it's all built in and you need to kind of mimic that behavior, but bring it into your own house. So the way you can do that 
is maybe through polling. So with polling is very much just repeatedly doing the same thing, asking for data, asking for data. So it's kind of a little bit of a diagram here. But what it basically is, is probably all know this, but after a few seconds, you'll go, any updates, any updates, any updates, and eventually they'll go, oh, yeah, here's some stuff. And it's kind of very inefficient for both the clients who send in the requests and the server who every time has to go, oh, I'll check, oh, I'll check. It's a lot. And if you've got thousands of people attending an event, then there's going to be a lot of issues. So maybe we can do it better. And that, from the title of the talk, is amateur hour, and we can do something better. <laughs> so that's where WebSockets come in. The WebSockets might feel kind of underused. I think it's kind of not too overly common to use them. And it can feel a bit like they're from the future. But realistically, they were added to the browser about 12 years ago. Um, so it's a bit long overdue. We use something to do something with them. So it's, that's kind of where this is going. So with WebSockets, you get one, one connection. You send a request, and it goes, cool, you're cool. I'm going to send you data. And that's, that's it. The clients can leave, stop doing anything. The server can just chill. And eventually, maybe the host of the event would go, all right, I'm going to show everyone this question and encourage them to answer it. Or a student can go, I'm going to send this, send this answer. And that's when the data is sent. So it kind of stays open um, for the entire event. So maybe it's like an hour or two. Well, hour. But so it's a lot, a lot more efficient. You don't have to do extra processing or extra kind of wasted resources. You can just do it when it's um, ready. So of course, you do what everyone does when they don't know anything about a technology. Well, you don't know what's the best option. So you Google it and you go, well, what's scalable? I'll see, I need to know how many users can I support? What happens if it gets really popular and suddenly 10 times the people show up one day? You need to have a kind of approach for that. So you've got various options that you can kind of come across. And the first one would be do it yourself. So the kind of typical approach for this would be you do a EC2. So with an EC2, that's just a plain server, and you'd maybe put a um, node process on there with running a kind of express or something, and you add a WebSocket package and handle it yourself. And each user can connect to the single server, and the single server can then send data to everyone else. And that's fine. But then what happens when more people show up? And suddenly, everything's on fire because you've run out of capacity. So there are things you can do about this. You can handle things like, um, well, First, you Google it and you panic and go, oh, I don't know, because no one really knows the answer to this. And if you look on all of the kind of resources, no one really knows exactly how many users can do it, because it depends on a lot of things, like how big is the EC2? How many resources have you paid for? Like, um, how much processing are you doing per request? Like, that kind of thing. There's lots of stuff that can vary. And the conclusion is there isn't a number. You have to kind of wing it. So one thing you can do to kind of mitigate that is have a bunch of metrics that eventually cause you to scale up. So with an application load balancer, you can have what is called sticky sessions. So with WebSockets, the single user will always talk to one EC2. And with that, you can kind of scale horizontally. So when you think, oh, this box is getting too many users, I can pop up a new one, pop up a new one, and scale that way. And you think, great, job done. Got, got scale now, we can um, go home. Now you've got the issue, you've got all these separate instances, but what happens when one gets data, and that's chilling, it's got updates, and the rest of them haven't got a clue what's going on because no one's told them. So then you've got to do something like maybe have web sockets between all of the boxes so they can all talk to each other, and what happens if one says one thing and one says another thing and they conflict and panic, and maybe you want to have like a king box or a leader and you go that's the one that's in charge and what happens when that dies and you have no source of truth anymore so it can get a bit chaotic really so there is another option api gateway so api gateway added support for um web sockets without having a server so this lets you have serverless web sockets because api gateway will maintain the connection for you so you don't have to worry about how big is my server? How many of them are there? You can just have API Gateway, gather all the servers, gather all the requests, sorry, and then um, keep all the connections open for you. So the, the, the connection time we can do is a couple hours um, until it will kind of make, trigger a refresh and restart. But it means you can have serverless. So you can now have functions. And if more people join, you just run them functions more. And you can kind of scale that way. So that's really nice. But there are issues. 
So the way that it works is it'll give you a connection ID, and then you have to obviously save that connection ID and use it later. So this user has joined, I've got connection ID one, and then later on when I need to send that user information, I go, oh, I'll go in my database, grab that ID and get it out. The issue with this is there's no broadcasting functionality. So you have to spam it as fast as you can to get information out. It's very much designed for kind of single user focusing. So here, when I want to show a question, I have to go, all right, everyone in the database quickly send as much data as you can as quickly as you can. And it's slow. Like you have to send a request, API request every single time. So if you've got thousands of people in a session, like it's going to take a while. So everyone's going to be a bit delayed. It's going to be about focus. You have that like, oh, delay, oh, and it's going to be a bit awkward. So there are ways obviously you can mitigate this. You can focus on um, maybe when you want to send out a broadcast, you spin up a load of lambdas, and then all of those send out a few requests each. You kind of go that way, but then you've got the cold start issue with spinning up a thousand lambdas at once. Um, so it's, it's not great. So this is where AppSync comes in. So I've kind of not fallen in love, but I do quite like it um, with AppSync. So what AppSync allows you to do is it handles a lot of it for you um, without having to do even um, serverless functions. So we've got rid of self-managed servers, we don't want them. And then we've got rid of serverless functions as well, because all of this stuff isn't particularly you know, complicated. We're putting information in the database and we're tweaking the information in the database and we're sending it out. Why do we need to write code for that when it's basically standard? There's not much business logic there on the server. Like you're just putting information in one place, moving it to another place and sending it to people. So this is what AppSync comes in with mapping templates. So what mapping templates are is effectively just when you get a request, you generate some JSON and then AppSync will do the rest. So it will go to your databases, put the data, put the information in the database, take the information out of the database, all for you, which is really nice. But it allows you to have a code-free API, almost code-free API, or if you don't want to, you can use code as well. So it's kind of flexible with that. But I know we all think code is bugs and, well, perfect all the time, but you get the point. Um, so what is AppSync necessarily? So I'm talking about WebSockets, but if we go back to the, AppSync under the hood, it's basically just a GraphQL API. So where you'd need an API to get the data for kind of initial payloads and stuff like that, it gives you that for you. And it has the added benefit that it'll also do WebSockets. So I'll talk about it in a sec, but kind of just a brief overview of what AppSync does. So it takes in the GraphQL request, runs it through some templates, interacts with database and sends out the response. That's all it does. Um, and it's kind of really powerful in what you can do with that. There's lots of options you can do whereas an app sync will kind of orchestrate it for you. So um, da, 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 there we go. So if we start out, I've got a GraphQL schema. You don't really need to know too much detail about what it necessarily does, but here we've got a mutation for creating an event. So we want our hosts to create an event and it show users. So when they're on the website, you'll kind of see the events happening. And what that will do is you can create a resolver for that mutation. So this is a bit, um, crazy. So you don't necessarily need to see the details, but what it's doing is at the top, you've got a resolver and that maps to the, the mutation and the bottom, you've got a function. They call it a function. It's not really a serverless function necessarily. Like it's a function within AppSync and all you can do is, well, you can do a lot, but the option here is mapping templates. So there's this kind of section at the bottom here, which is just JSON necessarily of an interaction, like an action with the database. So here, when this template runs, I'm putting an item in a database. Um, and that's kind of pretty simple. You don't need to run code to interact with AWS, put the information in the thing. What happens if that request fails? You know, it's, it's all standard stuff. You don't need to do it yourself. So why bother? You can just generate it. So here, I'm putting an item in a database. There are nice little util functions you can do, um, adding IDs. Um, mapping to DynamoDB types and all that jazz. Um, so you can make nice servers, make nice GraphQL APIs, kind of on the sly, very cheap. It's quite nice. So we've got this new API, and we've got this old view Firebase website. How can we kind of bridge the two? We've got this new shiny DynamoDBs, and they're all they're lovely and all you know, great. But we've got all these users. 
So what AppSync will let you do is kind of link in with a bunch of different authentication types and database types and request types, things like that. So here, with our Firebase site, we had um, Google OpenID authentication. Boom, you can just plug it in. Like it's, it accepts a lot of options. And when it doesn't accept an option that is available, you have Lambda as a fallback. So all of these things you can do, authentication and data requesting. Oh, AppSync doesn't support it. You can use a Lambda. So it's kind of very flexible in that. And you kind of, you're not tied down to one method. You've got a lot of, like of flexibility. So when we do come to the data that we've got, I don't want to have to migrate user data because it's not fun. Like you've got one database and you've got to move it to another database and you've got to go back into the view site and update that. And it's just not worth it. So what if we can use the existing data in the new site? And if, you, if it was a nice database to use, you could just plug it in, maybe create a Lambda resolver and work that way. But I was lazy. So in the end, I went into our um, API on the Firebase site and just added a root. So slash API slash user, one of the options you have for a data source is just HTTP. So I can go, cool. I don't know about that data, but when I request a user or the user's information, just go to the old site, get the information out, pass a token. It's all, this, all the tokens work all the way through um, and it will return the data. And as long as it matches the format that your schema expects, it will just magically work and it will return you data. If you ask for the student's name, then you'll get the student's name. It's great. So now we've got our old site with our authentication and our data, and you've got the new site with GraphQL API, and you've got um, kind of interactivity through that, and all the information in the DynamoDBs are all kind of nicely there. But I promised WebSockets, and none of that was about WebSockets yet. So one of the benefits of AppSync is that you've, obviously you've got this request template, and it goes through this. So you make a request to maybe show a question, that process through the database, updates the database value and returns the response. Where the power from AppSync comes through is you can attach onto the response of a mutation. So when one of the hosts goes, okay, I'm gonna tweak this a little bit, the subscription can listen in and send that data to everyone else. So, and secretly subscriptions are just WebSockets. So it's kind of sneaky in that. It's a, a nice way of doing it. Obviously I'm a big fan of GraphQL anyway, but. It's a nice benefit of this is that you've got a WebSocket available. So here, I've added a GraphQL subscription in the same way of a mutation and a query. A subscription is just another one of those types. And when you'd make a GraphQL request for some data, you can also just do a subscription. And when there's data on that subscription available, it will just send it. And you can use consume that on the client like a WebSocket or for you. And there's obviously relay and things like that. You can do it on the web. So here, what's happening is when the create event mutation runs, all I'm doing, this is only configuration, you don't have to write any resolvers or anything like that. It's just going, all right, AppSync, when I run this mutation, when the request comes through, the response will have the, the, the event in it, I imagine, for this one. Cool, when, when you've got that, if anyone's listening to this create event subscription, then send it out, like all it comes through. So when you're, for example, if every student runs a mutation to submit an answer, that all the host has to do is subscribe to an answers subscription and every mutation creates an entry in the database and passes it through. And suddenly the hosts have got all that information. So it's kind of really powerful in that you don't have to worry about managing the user connections. You don't have to worry about, oh, I'm going to send this data to that user and this, it's all for you. If you want to subscribe to this and you can put authentication limits, make sure that not everyone's getting access to all the data, but it's just kind of, extremely powerful and it'll just let you do that. But I promise scale. And this is all well and good, but how many users can it support? Do I need to have multiple APIs? So then you, of course, you Google it and you go, how many users can it support? Like I need to, you know, I can't scale up one server. So what can I do? And then you look at the spec sheets on Amazon and you go, okay, well, I've got limits for API keys and I've got limits for authentication but nothing here about the number of users, like what's going on. So then of course you go to the holy grail of information, you go to Reddit <laughs> and you, someone's asking how many users can you connect? And the consensus is we haven't got a clue. So the general gist of it from what I can tell is that try to stay under the subscriber, like the limits on connections for other AWS services, but it's basically in the millions. So don't worry about it. 
which obviously isn't perfect for everything, but for most cases, you just don't have to worry about it. So that's quite nice. We've got all of this connection. Don't have to worry about the user's connections. I can just subscribe to the events that I want to subscribe to. And it's win. But it can't all be good. This is a kind of platform as a service compared to running your own server. This is kind of infrastructure as a service. There is going to be drawbacks. And with API Gateway, the drawback was broadcasting information. And there's a few things here. So there are some things that are hidden from you. And you kind of need to be aware of that going in. So two things are kind of main things that you focus on. So with performance, you are restricted to what CloudFront tells you. So it does give you some information about um, how many milliseconds it takes to send out a response. But you're kind of taking their word for it and going, OK, you're measuring it in that way. I've basically only got that metric. So you are restricted in that. If you were to write your own Lambda, which you can do for all of this, every stage of the resolvers can be Lambdas. You can do your own metrics in there. You can add markers, and you can send it to new Relic and all that jazz. But you are limited to that. And if you're using the mapping templates, you just have to kind of go, well, yeah, no, what CloudFront says, um, I'll respect that. And you're a bit restricted than that. And then the other thing is subscribe accounts. So with API Gateway, for example, or with EC2s, you can kind of tell always how many users are connected. Either you look at the, how big the database is, or you just count the number of requests in the EC2. And you've got the information. With AppSync, you don't have that. So they're handling it all for you, but you're a bit restricted. So there are ways you kind of have to avoid that. With um, this use case with Parallel, you're very much, we want attendance data. So we're kind of sent, we have to send um, requests every kind of period of time. So I think we're doing it every minute now for um, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, which is a bit like polling, but um, it allows you to interact with the database um, kind of for each user and update their account. So it, we would need to do that anyway, because you need to know like, oh, this user was here from this time till this time, and then they dropped off for a bit. So it's not a subscriber count on its own wouldn't be enough for that, but you are having to do something to kind of know how many people are on the site at one time. But wait, there's more. So I've said it um, previously, but authentication options, native source options, you've got a lot to kind of choose from. So it was kind of lucky for us that OpenID was an authentication option. Um, and obviously with DynamoDB was kind of the default choice, but there are other options. But with both of these, you've got Lambda as a fallback. So you don't have to worry about oh, it doesn't handle this authentication option, but I kind of need to use it because I've got this legacy thing, or, oh, um, I want to plug directly into this database, but it's not one of the supported options. All of that, you can go straight to Lambda and just run it. And wherever you can run Node, you can, well, or any other language, they've got a bunch. Um, but you can just go straight to them. So you don't have to worry about that, and you kind of got, have that flexibility. And with that, you get a lot of transferable setup. So if you're worried that, OK, I like this app sync, but it's, you know, I'm a bit worried that I might not like it in a few years' time and go, OK, I regret that. That was annoying. And now everything's in AppSync and it's hard to migrate. If you're worried about that, you can write this all as lambdas. You don't have to worry about mapping templates necessarily if you don't want to. Or you can do that for the simple stuff. And all that is is just JavaScript. You can move that out at one point if you want to. So it's kind of really flexible with that. So yeah, you don't have to use mapping templates. That's not your vibe, which is very nice. So celebrate. We have an API. We have WebSockets. It's amazing. Um, we kind of built this up um, a few months ago now. We've had some events with like hundreds and hundreds of students, and it's gone really well. So um, all, everyone gets subscribed to kind of the live event, and they just get the updates as it goes through. So you kind of make the event page show the event, and then questions will come up, and chat will happen. And it's amazing. So yeah, um, thank you for listening. If you have any kids ages, nine to fuzziness, um, nine to 18, then I very much suggest checking out Parallel. It's kind of a great resource. And my designing is awful. So if you're a designer, um, drop me a DM if you want to be friendly. Thank you. <laughs>